Okay, so the parsha begins. Oh, kind of good. One. Thank you very much. The last parsha in the first book of the Torah. For those of you that have been attending regularly, the Thursday parsha, and have been looking at it regularly every week, so you can feel a little sense of celebration. Whenever we finish a book of learning, we celebrate. It's a party. And it's a simcha. Um, and in fact, my, my grandson, I was just studying with him just now, but he's by mitzvah, and he uh, is finishing a, a, a major volume of the Talmud, um, uh, which is a pretty great accomplishment for his bar mitzvah, and that would deserve to the party as well. And the fact that you finish or accomplish something in learning. Uh, certainly, if you got a bar mitzvah, you've reached the stage in your life, or a bat mitzvah, so you reach the stage that, that is worthy of celebration because, I mean, after all, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you've accomplished it. You've reached 13 or 12. That's a, a graduation of sorts. So you make a celebration. And if you uh, get married, certainly it's a certain important, uh, uh, an important level of your life, an important stage in you, celebrate as well. Finishing something and learning is worthy of celebration. And we are finishing today the first book of the Torah. Uh, now, for those of us that maybe have not really studied it that intensely, um, you still have, you are allowed to celebrate. Why? Because by joining in with those that have been intensely and intensively studying, you are now realize the sense of the beauty of it, and therefore you will now undertake to do the same with the next book in the Torah, book number two. Book number one is Genesis, the beginning. Book number one is Bereshit, and it says in the Torah and that, 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 that the beginning of the world. So of course, we've covered so many topics in this uh, throughout this. Um, uh, book of Bereshit. We've covered the topics of uh, creation and and uh, and uh, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, and uh, then the, the flood and Noah and uh, and the, the emergence of the Jewish people through Abraham, our father, our father of Eden. Uh, the stories of our of our ancestors, particularly Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the three patriarchs, uh, were fascinating adventures of um, going through all sorts of difficulty and crisis and challenge um, in order to find the truth, in order to live by the truth, in order to, uh, to, 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 uh, to achieve the, the, uh, the sense of a direction in life. And that direction therefore puts you in a way in which you're, you really are feeling that you know, you've accomplished. But then again, it's because of those uh, the pitfalls, those trials and tribulations. So every time you get through, you go through life and you go through Crisis or difficulty or challenge or one or two or three or four. The response is or the reaction is, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to develop with inside me the power, the energy, and the ability to handle crisis, handle difficulty, and uh, and emerge a better person because of it. So uh, we, we uh, don't shirk. When, when the difficult times uh, go and rise to the occasion. Uh, rising to the occasion is, is a, uh, it's a, of course, uh, the great achievement. And that, that's what, what, what our humanity is all about. And anybody can live through life, but everything is sugar coated. And you're born, and your father's had a great opinion there, and, and, and you, you live in a, in a funny roof mansion all your life, and then you grow up in the, and then the, you move forward, and nothing you do in the world is makes anything because you inherit your father's millions, uh, and you've never learned uh, to make them on your own. So you spend the rest of your life spending them instead of earning any more money, and at the end of the day, you buy penalties. Life is meant to achieve. Now there are spiritual achievements, understanding Hashem, living a good life, and there are plus financial achievements, and physical achievements. Whatever, nice, a healthy body, you go to the gym, you know, uh, 
And there are many good things that, that are important in life. Um, I'll give you eight areas of existence of life that are important to all of us. And these eight, these eight steps, these eight things are really from the, uh, from the 48 ways, from the 48 ways that, of, 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 that, that, um, that I read each. And these 48 ways were subdivided into, um, into eight um, groupings of, 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 of life's aspirations. What do we want to have out of life? First thing I want to have out of, I want to have out of life is um, I want to learn how to think. I want to learn how to be able to, uh, to, to, to use my head and make right decisions and learn information and grow and develop. Most important thing that we uh, seek out of life first, and then most of all, first, I don't want to become a thinking person, an intellectual, not a dummy. I don't want to sleepwalk through life. The second thing is I want to have a social life. I want to have friends and, and family and, and, and marriage and, and, and the beautiful things that all that comes, comes with that. Third thing, of course, is an education. And we want success in all these areas. Fourth, of course, I said physical. Fifth is mental. Mental health is a, is, is, is a major challenge. How to handle crisis on, an, on, a, on a mental level um, and, and not for a heart, so to speak. And all of these things are, 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 uh, are what life is all about. These are the stories of our ancestors. This is the heroism, heroism of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, I probably went through 10 tests. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's referred to in the mission that uh, the ethics of fathers, uh, chapter five. They passed them all. And I'm giving up his faith. Um, the uh, 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 told to leave his homeland, to the new land, did to go to Eretz Israel. That wasn't easy. He found Eretz Israel, it was hard to make a living in Eretz Israel. He didn't have any uh, uh, famine. He had to go to Egypt. They stole his wife. He came back, and his nephew rebelled against him. And he had to fight a whole war. And then he, and, and, and then he had no children. And finally, he had a son who was a rebellious. And finally, after all those times, he finally God granted him a son. And then God said, "Sacrifice your son, your own son, the one you love." And then, of course, we all know that he passed that test and he didn't have to sacrifice it at all. A tough life. But then I have to stop. And that's what I hear of teachers. But why is that valuable and important? Because it is tough. And we have the strength within us to develop the ability to handle it and to maximize it and to become better because of it, better people because of it. That's so rewarding. That's what life is all about. That makes life beautiful. And so Yitzchak, our father, the second father, had, a, had similar challenges. Uh, and finally, of course, Yaakov, our father, the third father, who was going to pass away in this parasha, had also very heavy duty challenges. And um, in fact, if you look at last week's parish for a quick second, uh, we mentioned the fact that Paro wanted to meet, uh, uh, we mentioned the past Sunday, Paro wanted to meet the Yaakov. He wanted to meet the man whose son saved this country. Wow. I'd like to see this guy. And of course, we find out that he does so uh, on page... Um, um, the, the, we find that um, uh, page 264 on the top of 264, the very top of 265. Uh, Paro meets Yaakov. Paro meets Yaakov. Um, and Yaakov uh, blesses him. Yeah, Yaakov, uh, let's take a look, take a look back at one page, uh, page 261, 263, sorry, the bottom. Joseph brings his father, Jacob, presents it for Paro, and Yaakov, Jacob, blesses him. What's the significance of that? The significance, of course, is, is that Paro wants the brother. 
<laughs> Yaakov does not ask him for a bracha. I guarantee you that. I'm not asking Joe Biden for anything. Right? Joe's got to ask me. Right. Joe, needs, right? Joe, needs, Joe needs our bracha. The political leader needs the religious leader for for uh, for for blessing. The political leader has all his power. The rabbi, the priest, the the, the, the imam, whatever it is, uh, all these guys uh, offer him, you know, a blessing and maybe sugarcoat his presidency or his leadership. But in the end, all the power that the uh, that the political leader yields or wields and has is uh, subject to Hashem. Subject to the master of the universe, the king of all kings, the master of all masters. And so therefore, uh, uh, there's no question that the, uh, Paro is a, is a major leader in a major country. He needs uh, well, he needs the blessing of, of, uh, of, of uh, Yaakov. He, he needs uh, the Yaakov. The, the, he's the holy man. Yaakov is the holy man. That was the religious man. I need the blessing of a religious man to help my, my administration, my presidency to succeed. And that's what, uh, what, what Paro seeks. That's what Yaakov bless him. Yaakov gives him a bracha because Yaakov doesn't need the religious man. The holy man does not need the bracha of the leader, of, of the politician. He has no bracha to give anyway. He has no, no religious sense of, 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 of a connection with Hashem that could possibly be the rock in any event. But Paro needs Yaakov. The president needs somebody at the inauguration to say a holy prayer, whatever's at the uh, inauguration in Washington. So uh, this is significant. I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, but, but he asks him, Paro asks him, says, how, how, long, how old are you? How many are the, are the days of years of your life? How old are you? Jacob says, well, it's been a long day, many days, many years, many sojourns, 130 years, few and bad, have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not reached the lifespans of my forefathers in the days of this sojourn. And Jacob plus Paro once again left Paro. We learned from this that the Yaakov did a mistake. And we talked about this all the time, you know, people greeting each other, hello, how are you? Remember that, 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 that fake Hawaiian that everybody's got, you know, hello, how are you? I really mentioned the Hawaii. I mean, right? Everybody in, in California in LA, they're all everyone's friendly, right? Hello, have a nice day, right? We talked about that, you know. <laughs> right, have a nice day. Hello, how are you today? How are you? You want to know how I am? I'll give you 20 minutes to tell you how I am. <laughs> well, that's what Yaakov does over here to you borrow. How are you? Well, I'll tell you how I am. See, gives them all this. This uh, th th this my uh, 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 you said uh, uh, that's an old story there, but but uh, Yaakov was punished for it because Yaakov should not have been so elaborate. You missed you a lot. That's true. Your brother persecuted you. I mean, your brother been enemy since day one. He certainly went apart at fifteen when you pursued the code and he pursued evil. Um, uh, uh, there's no question that uh, that uh, how you had to leave home after you took the blessings legitimately, and you had to go to uh, to uh, where you had to go. You had to go to uh, to, to your uncle Lovin, who was the biggest cheat in town. And with, the, with the, when he came to to, to, to love him, you had the he, he he cheated you left and right, right and left, and you were Hashem protected you anyway, and you became wealthy in any event, uh, which is quite interesting, by the way. Next time someone tries to teach cheat you, don't worry about it too much. You can't do a whole lot. You have a shell on your side. Uh, but 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 you know, uh, Yaakov has, has had a rough time, and then of course. Uh, but after he finally gets the, his family together and his, and his fortune together, he would come, to come home to see his parents, try and bring his family home. And then what happens? And then, the, and then the, his, his, his brother who hates him is going to come marching out of the 400 soldiers. Who knows what his plans are? Yaakov manages to dodge a bullet again. And um, 
And uh, of course, uh, uh, and then his, his daughter gets in trouble. And then of course, the worst thing of all, his son is abducted. And Joseph is taken to Mitzrayim. And he thinks his son has died, his favorite son, the son of his beloved wife who died young in childbirth of the second son. And he is, uh, he is been living in misery all his life. But he finally comes to the triumph to reunite with his son. We talked about this past Sunday. One of the most dramatic moments in human history. One or two years of thinking you're dead and you're alive again. And the hope and the, and the, and the, and the, and the dreams and, and the tears and, and the love and the, and the joy. And it's, it's awesome. But Joseph says, I have to tell you, during these 22 years, they made me a vice president of, of Egypt. And Jacob was not impressed. He did. And we still go into the tradition. We still keep Shabbat. We still do mitzvah. You still do what you're supposed to be doing. You still follow the teachings that I taught you. Or did you abandon me? Because of political need necessity or whatever. And so Yosef tells him that uh, I'm still as loyal as ever to the faith. Which of course is a great accomplishment as a plenty of the I mean <laughs> I mean you can spend five days five five days downtown and in Hollywood Boulevard and fall apart. Right? <laughs> 22 years in Egypt and, 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 and right um that's five days in Hollywood Boulevard. Vegas, one day, you're done. <laughs> so, um, clearly, um, clearly, uh, uh, Yaakov uh, is, is delighted. With it. He says, Father, I want you to meet my boss, Haro. He wants to meet you. Well, you want to be hit. I don't like you. <laughs> He's like, what, what are you the United States? I don't care. What do I want? Who's he? But he needs you. He wants to see and meet the father of the men that saved Egypt. Okay. So he meets him and he blesses him, which Paro's definitely is, is needing and seeking and begging for. And then what? And then it doesn't run how I am, I'll tell you. And that's the case of what they call nowadays TMI. It's TMI. Too much information. <laughs> too much information. Game too much. And the rabbi says punished for it. Um, he is punished for it because there were 33 words he used in his description of all of his service. What are you complaining about? And what life is. That's what life is supposed to be. Tough challenges, difficulties, problems, face them, meet up with them. Do the right thing. Don't give up. Don't complain. Man wants to, to start to have has these, these, these challenges in life and he wants to complain to a champ. So uh most of the drawers the door, and uh, he opened the door. He opened the door. Right? Of course, I would tell him, you know, go more, use a little more brain than brawn, figure it out, you know. Anyway, guy's all upset because he can't open the drawer. That's so much shame. Could be a whole lot worse. Would you want worse? Could you, you want us to really bring you some, some real service? Some real problems? Be grateful. And so uh, uh, Yaakov makes this mistake, complains, uh, and uh, he says that he's living less than his, uh, than, than his, um, uh, than that he's, uh, his ancestors. Avram died at 175, Yitzhak died at 180, and he will die at 147, 33 years less than he should have lived to the 180 of his father. So he, he ended up uh, with, uh, 
32 years less because he complains. You complain about your life, you don't like it, the less of it. Be grateful for every morning you can see the sunshine and say, Modani, thank you, Hashem. So, so um, th that's the story. Uh, one other thing I want to mention about last week's parsha also is that. Um, um, that uh, at the bottom of the page 265, right? And when the year ended, the people came to Joseph and the next year and said to him, we will not withhold from my Lord that with the money and flocks of cattle having been exhausted, we have nothing left but our bodies and our land. We, I mean, you've been making us buy them food. We stored up the food during the seven good years. You're making us buy it during the seven bad years. And we had nothing left. No more money, no more livestock, no more nothing. And uh, and uh, he, they're complaining, you know, that, that we will, number nine, verse 19, it turned the page. Why should we die before your eyes? We need food, we need bread. We will become serfs to Paro, he says, uh, the, 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 the Egyptian people. And provide seed so that we may live and not die in the land and not become desolate. Thus, verse 20, Joseph acquired all the land of Egypt for Paro. He doesn't acquire the land for himself. He has no, no self-interest. He has no interest in corruption, no interest in taking money and spending money and earning money. It doesn't matter to him. It, it, it never did uh, for Joseph. Uh, money spent in vain. There's no value. You are, this is for Paro. I'm a servant of Paro. I'm an employee of Paro. He uh, runs the country. He gave me the job. I'm doing for him and loyalty and service. Anything I collect is for him. Of course, this is a man of great integrity. And we know that about Joseph for sure. And uh, he's always been that way uh, in, in that regard. And uh, he's, um, he's uh, uh, taking the money for Paro. But it says over there that in so doing, okay, um, the land will become serfs to power. You will own our properties, our livestock, our land, our uh, everything is yours. And the country owns not only the land and the people and the people themselves. In other words, communism, basically. The first, the first experience in communism. Uh, and uh, this experience. Uh, it makes the uh, makes power of uh, total control, which I uh, guess is a political mistake on Joseph's part, only because of the fact that eventually turns on the Jews, but uh, which we'll learn about next week. But for now, he does this with the loyalty in mind for his uh, for his for his king. Um, however, take a look at verse twenty three. As for the nation, he was set on the cities okay, by one, uh, for one end of each, one of the other. 22, only the land of the priests did he not buy. Somehow there's a respect for religion once again. Somehow there's a respect for the, cler for the clergy, for the, for, the, for the religious people, for the spiritual people. The priests had a stipend from Paro. They lived off the stipend Paro given them. It is the requirement of the government. To support the religious people. So, if let's say students in Israel want to study in the Shiva and learn Torah as a spiritual pursuit, uh, it becomes the government's responsibility to provide for them. They don't need to get jobs. And the Mishnah confirms that in Perkyevo. The Mishnah says in the Ethics of Fathers, whoever accepts upon himself the obligation of the Torah to pursue a spiritual life of learning all day. And, and, and spiritual pursuits all day, and prayer all day, and uh, and learning and mastering the texts all day. That person we call him a a, a kolel person, a person who lives in the kolel. He's called an avrech. That person he's not going to become wealthy, and the government's not going to give him a whole lot of money, but enough for him to support him and his family is the government's responsibility. Um, and that's probably something that's politically right now a hot potato. In Israel, where the secularists in Israel don't believe this, and the secularists don't believe that we need any religious people in Israel at all, or any religion for that matter. And as a result of that, the secularists uh, who are running government want to defund 
It's a popular word these days, you know, defund the, the, the yeshivas. And, uh, and of course, it may, you know, that's all it's going to do is make those people who are studying live a little more frugally, a little on, on less. Uh, and their children will eat less. So thank you, secularists, for, for not only jeopardizing us or, or harming us, but at the same time, harming yourselves as well, because your only real sense of support, your only real sense of safety in Israel is your support of the religious. And failing to do that uh, only puts uh, the rest of Israel in great danger. So in any event, we get this perspective here of Paro respecting the religious man, Paul Yaakov, and respecting the religious man for his spirituality and asking for his blessing. And we get this perspective that Paro will not ask any money from the priests over here in Egypt as well. Um, and the Parsha ends uh, last week. Israel settled in the land of Egypt in the region of Goshen, acquired property. They were fruitful and multiplied greatly. Somehow or another, the Jews seem to be <laughs> successful <laughs> whenever they do it, any event. Maybe they, I know they own all the banks or something. <laughs> whatever they say about Jews. Anyway, the is over. And the next Parsha begins. Third page. This week's Parsha, Vayachi. What does the word Vayachi mean? Let's take a look at the top in the Hebrew and spell Vav, Yud, Chet, Yud. And let's take the Vav, Yud out of the equation for a moment and leave Chet, Yud. What do I got? Life. 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 This is all about living. <clears throat> Now, we've had another parsha earlier when, this, when Sarah, our mother, passed away, and we called it Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah. That means at the time of death, a person's life is celebrated. It means to say that when a person uh, has a, a, a lived a full and, and, and beautiful and productive and accomplished life, the, in the sense of their passing uh, only means that, that they're changing location. It only mean, it doesn't mean anything more than than that. In fact, there is a continuous, uh, continued existence in the world to come in heaven. I once mentioned it, I'll mention it again. Great rabbi in Israel once told me 250 people come to the funeral. Another 250 people, only one goes home. We understand that. Only one goes home. The rest of us stuck here <laughs> to maintain the full challenge to meet up with the tomorrow's challenges. <laughs> and it's a real truth. It's a truth. We, well, we use an interesting word for, for passing or death. We call it mitzvah. What's mitzvah? I'm exempt. I'm patur. I no longer have to worry about taking a shower one morning. I no longer have to worry about paying my bills or making sure the electric is taken care of. I no longer have to worry about anything. I'm the door. Um, we, of course, get so used to our lives in this world that these simple, nonsensical, <clears throat> mundane things take on an important reality. I mean, who doesn't take a shower? Who doesn't rush the day? That's it. That's what I'm paying you for. Take a shower. <laughs> These small items become so big and so important. Whether well, God created you to get a job, that's what He created you for. That's about as important as taking a shower. You do what you got to do, not because it's important. So we all homeless. No, it's what you got to do. But but it's not, it's not that, that God didn't create you to buy a house. <laughs> what do you do with the house? You live in it. 40 years, 50 years, 80 years, I don't know, God gave grants you. Then what? Small house. Then you get, then you get six by six. <laughs> the new house. It's a new house, right? <laughs> well, so what, what, what are we living for? That's, a, that's the idea. And if we realize what we're living for, what the purpose is, and we maximize that purpose, and we thank God for the opportunity to maximize it, we become greater people because of it. Our life is therefore purposeful. We've achieved. And if that's the case, death is nothing more than a transition to a more beautiful, smoother place 
uh, without all those obligations. And then one goes home. And so uh, this is the, 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 the passing of Yaakov. In other words, take a look at verse one and it says, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years and the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147. Simple math, folks. How old was he, how old was he when he got to Egypt? 130. Thank you. Okay. And so, uh, so, so um, uh, but why, does it, why does the Torah tell us this? Because he's ready to die. The time I broke for Israel to die. So we say Jacob lived as the opening of a parsha when he's going to die. Because his death does not stop his living at all. Just moves it to a new, a new plane. In any event, um, what's interesting is what is called the closed section. Uh, I've often taught over and over again throughout these weeks, particularly uh, in these uh, 10 or 12 uh, portions that we've been studying in this first book of the Torah, um, about the connection, and I've stressed this over and over again, the connection between the end of the last parasha, of last week's parasha, to the beginning of the next week's parasha. And I've done that purposely in order to be able to demonstrate the continuity. And it's not always a continuity in time. The chronological, the continuity in ideology, continuity in, in, in a point, the continuity with, with, with an idea to, to transmit. And uh, what's the continuity between last week's parsha, the end of last week's parsha, and the beginning of this week? Take a look at the commentary on page 266, I'm not kidding, 268, sorry, 268, uh, the commentary in the bottom. Let's read it. The closed section. In the entire Torah scroll, by a is unique in that there is no extra space between it and the preceding marsha. In contrast to the general rule that a sutra begins on a new line or that is separated from the previous one by at least a nine letter space. So, in other words, if I'm, let's say, here's a Torah scroll. It's a Torah scroll? I think it was a Torah scroll, right? But a Torah scroll, Whenever I finish a particular thought or idea, we'll end up with a paragraph, we'll make an indentation, something like this, you know, and the line won't end. Or there'll be a totally blank line underneath it, and then the next thought will come across. You see that? And the, 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 see the blank, the blank space? It tells you a new idea or a new paragraph. And you say, I say, oh, that's the only punctuation you get in the Torah. <laughs> the rest of those vowel notes that we're used to trying to learn how to read, that ain't going to happen. And that's not in the Torah. And so um, uh, the, the, these, these spaces are very valuable, particularly when you end one parsha of the last week and begin the next one. Every time in order to distinguish between one parsha and the next, between the end of one and the beginning of the next, is the idea of a space. It's got to be a space there. Then you know, and the reader of the Torah will know when to stop and when to begin the, and, and, and to come back the next week and read it again and right? read it again. Be further the next the next uh, 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 par partial. You want to say what I'm saying? Right? Okay. There is no such indent, no such blank between last week's partial and this one. It's the only one that there's no blank at all. And there's no way to say, no way to tell except let you memorize it. There's no way to tell the end of Ayigash and the beginning of Ayigash. There's just no way. Unless you know, unless you learn it. And understand and study it through here, and you know where one and one begins, and you and you, you were there last week, and I mean, let you know. Well, if you, whereas the other parts that you could say, well, maybe this part is over, next one's starting, because you see a blank, there's no blank here. It's called the closed section. Let's read why. Rashi, therefore, describes by here stuma, closed, a condition that is meant to teach something about the mood of Jacob's children when he died. At that moment, the hearts of the children of Israel closed in expectation of the suffering and despair of the impending bondage. Immediately after his death, the spiritual exile began, even though the physical and emotional travails of enslavement did not commence until the death of all of his sons. So, in other words, uh, we all know that Jews will eventually be enslaved under the power of Egypt, but that won't happen until next week. When we start a new book, book number two, the book of Exodus, we'll talk about slavery and freedom and so forth. That won't happen until next week. Um, and yet over here, we're already anticipating 
um, I'm anticipating. What does it mean? Like, for instance, let's say everybody knows that the uh, maximum the Nazis, uh, the evil Nazis, the power of 1933. But not until 1938 did it become apparent that they were really coming after the Jews. What happened between 33 and 38? Little persecution here, little persecution there. Jews lose his job. Jews chop and go to school. Um, the Jews uh, uh, have to be identified. Maybe they were the, 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 the star, the star right? Uh, star, yellow star. I mean, you know, uh, a Jew can't bank in this bank. A Jew uh, uh, can't get this job. A Jew's denied that job. A Jewish boy who wants to go, let's say, to uh, to this college can't get in. You know, all sorts of little little subtle persecution like that. And we've had them in America too, uh, way back when. And I, I would tell you for sure. In the, in the 50s, if you had to do a Saturday night, a lot of times you didn't get a job um, that you wanted. Or if you didn't get the job, you didn't get the promotion you wanted. Well, listen, I mean, America has its history of prejudice in anything, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of prejudice in it. it's all different you know, groups and, and, and uh, Catholics and, and uh, Blacks and, and, and Puerto Ricans and, and Mexicans and so forth. And I get, okay, it, it happens. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate for the thinking. We, we learn to live with it, of course. Because we try to beat it and try to fight it and legislation or whatever. And Martin Luther King try to fight it. And you do the best you can. But um, with Jews, it's a little different. Because when those little things start happening with Jews, we get a little nervous. Because other groups, could have these little prejudices happen, and they, and that would be it. You know, you can't get a job. That's it. Or you know, there's a, there's a, you know, or a, or a, a, a black skin go to this restroom, they go to that restroom. That's about where it stops. The Jews are done. The Jews in Germany proved this. Once this little thing happened, and that little thing happens, a whole lot of great danger can occur. So you know, when a person comes to convert, for instance, we'll say to that person, are you sure you want to do this? No, Jews are, okay, okay. So I know there's relative freedom here in America. Thank God, not too bad, we're, we're okay. But you never know. Oh, stop being so extreme. Oh, stop being so worried or so nervous. Can't happen here, it's not Germany. It's Germany. Germany at the time was a very, very, uh, uh, elevated society of uh, of uh, people who uh, who who are elegant and, and, cultured. and, and cultured and learned and and and, and college grade and educated and so forth. The same guy at the college, you understand, pulled a gun and shot Jewish children. <laughs> yeah, college graduates. How much education? Um, so for Jews, we get a little nervous. And they started, they started getting nervous what they Why do you think this started around this time and didn't come full, did not become full blown enslavement, did not become full blown persecution until next week's party? And yet we're all worried right now. So I said we're worried because little things can turn into big things. what I said. Um, why did they start seeing little things? What happened? Well, of course, the, the, the whole question is what happened in the first place? I mean, I mean how could you have enslaved Jews? And the Jews saved the country. No? Didn't, didn't wasn't Joseph a Jew? Didn't he save the country? So, of course, we have, we have a very interesting phenomenon. Let's, let's turn to next week's parts for a real quick second and take a look at part of the beginning of uh, next week's part of Schmoes, right? Where it says on page, um, uh, page uh, 293. 293, and these are named the children of Israel who came to Egypt, blah, 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 blah. Here's all the names, Jacob and all his family. By the way, folks, in, 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 on 293, verse 2, you should be memorizing by this time the names of these 12 tribes. You should know these 12 tribes. Uh, I don't say, I mean, I, I'd be happy if you learned them in order, but if not, at least know them, all right? Okay, verse 5. All the persons were 70 people. Okay, fine. Verse 6. Joseph died. And all his brothers and all the generation. The children were fruitful, team increased, became strong very, very much, and the land became filled with them Jews. 
Verse 8. A new king would rule over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Had he known Joseph, he wouldn't have been so mean to the Jews. I mean, that's what it seems, right? But the fact of the matter is, how could you not know Joseph? How could you live in America and not know George Washington? How could you live in America and not know Abraham Lincoln? Come on. How do you live in Egypt and not know Joseph? Joseph saved the country. There would be no Egypt without Joseph. How do you not know him? And you're elected president on top of that. <laughs> you're elected king. How about that one? They want to say interesting thing. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, that's a, yeah, okay, we can, we can, that's a good idea. Uh, this is the way, uh, if you want to see it, this is the way it appears in the Torah. Uh, you see underlined the red is the beginning of the new parasha, and there's no break in between the old one and the new one. Right. So you know that? Uh, hi, Zoomies. Zoomies. Hey, Zoomies. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right, whatever. And um, and uh, we're gonna pass it around. Okay, whatever. Anyway, that that's how you see that the new parsha begins and the old parsha ends. So I did not know Joseph. So rabbis want to teach you a funny thing. It wasn't a new king at all. It says new king, but it ain't a new king. Well, how can you trust what the words of the Torah say? The answer is because. A new king doesn't necessarily mean a new physical king, and it means a new ideological king. So he was the same guy. He just changed his mind. <laughs> so he didn't know that it was the same guy. He told me he knew Joseph. Is that new Joseph, right? So Rashi says he made himself not know Joseph. Joseph, Joseph, oh, what did Joseph do? Yeah. Way back when. These Jews are too much. <laughs> Too much, too, too much Jews around here. You know? Anyway, and the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, he was an evil man. And um, he, uh, it, it, when it means new, it means there's new decrees. It means there's new rules. And the new rules are tragically will say slavery. And so, and so um, uh, again, he didn't know Joseph. He made himself believe he didn't know Joseph. And therefore, uh, he had no allegiance to the Jews. And it's very easy to put the Jews into slavery. And so they're fair. Let's go back to page 269. And everybody's scared of it right now. You see little subtle, subtle steps. But you know, the tragedy of me seeing little subtle steps is the tragedy of how many people are going to take it seriously? I'll tell you a great story. What was going before that? I don't know. I'll tell you again. One of the really nice and brown places of our community here in Northern told me an amazing story. He told me. And I'm here today because of an amazing land. My grandfather, she said to me, was a uh, prominent doctor in uh, Germany. Well liked, well respected, uh, had treated people with, with, with love and kindness and, and, and extra deed and so forth and so on. And um, every once in a while, there's a little persecution here and there. And people bumped into a Jew and said, uh, didn't say, excuse me. Or, you know, right? Or, or whatever, they, 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 whatever they did, you know, all sorts of little persecution. And one day, he being 35, let's say, his colleagues come to him and say, Look, Dr. So and so, Rosenberg, you know, Dr. So and so, we hate to tell you this because we really like you a lot and we really esteem and respect you. It's going to reconsider that, you know, for you no know, other reason but because of you. And uh, he said, thank you for the information. He went home, didn't think about discussing it with anybody or thinking he didn't get a job elsewhere, or maybe he might uh, make a protest to the government or whatever, you know, or one of, one of those streets, Jewish Lives Matter or something. He didn't do that. You know what he did? He told his family, take a suitcase or two, but that's it. Like everything you can do, get into the car, we're leaving tonight, and we're gonna drive over the Alps into Switzerland. And because he did that, his family survived, and his colleagues who did not do that, their families all were killed in the But when they did that, what were they doing? It's all you had is we're gonna go home today and look around your, your home and your place where you live. 
And imagine how much you can stick into one suitcase. Mm -hmm. Remember everything else left behind? The chairs, the tables, your the fine china set, your forks and knives and spoons and, 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 and cups and dishes that you really like, you know, use them for dinner or whatever. And maybe, maybe a, a woman's prized candlesticks for Shabbat. Whatever you can take, take now and forever leave behind. The chandelier. It's a beautiful couch, a magnificent table where 20 people gather on a Friday night, for instance, everything behind. And when you begin to think about doing that, then you think in reality. What's more important? My, my possessions are made. And, and uh, you know the funny story about Jack Benny, the famous Jewish comedian, they would say, that they, that guy would stick him up, and then they would just get on TV many years, and he would say then, Stay up, your money or your life. And Jack Benny would say, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> 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 uh, kind of funny, but it wasn't funny in, in Germany. And I think that's what's happening here. But here's another little camera where in Germany, whereas in Germany, you could get out earlier, you couldn't get out later. You can get out earlier. The Jews were not getting out here. Because they were not destined. Ooh, this was God's decree. You had to stay. Becoming slaves was a blessing. Because why? Because it made us strong and powerful. And while they beat us and hurt us and whatever they did to us, we became stronger and more resilient and more Jewish and more proud of ourselves than ever before. You can't break my spirit. And that's the whole idea of being able to meet the challenge of life, including those horrible ones. I mean, the, 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 what happened in recent history, in terms of the Holocaust, I mean, it's, it's unbearable. I mean, there are nights I can't sleep, just thinking about it. And, and, and we have to understand that um, we need to be strong, we need to make the right decisions, and we need to make them quick. And we need to look at what's going on in the world. What's going on in the world today is a lot, a lot of sad things. I mean, when they closed the synagogues on uh, on uh, on uh, on COVID a year and a half ago, so I was beside myself. I mean, okay, I got you. There's a problem out there. There's a COVID. This it is. This it that. And then you stop going short. That's exactly when you need to go back to short to get rid of the COVID. Who do you think is going to get rid of the COVID? The one who it. It's a sham. And you don't want me to go to Jew? Are you crazy? So we see that now the Jews are getting a little nervous. But I, my question is why did it happen upon Jacob's passing? As Jacob passes away, the little persecution starts, which is kind of strange because who was the real Jew who really made a difference in Egypt? Well, Jacob was Joseph. I would think that when is it all, all these problems solving? Yosef died. Then the like, guy can say it over Yosef. But no, it doesn't stop with Yosef's death. It's already in the makings uh, with Jacob's death. And how significant is Jacob to Egypt where they would, where, they, where, 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 where these issues could start? And the answer is because just like we said earlier, Paro had a respect for religious people. They respected Jacob as Jacob from the Brooklyn, not vice versa. And he said to, uh, he, he would collect money from the cities of the priests, right? Religious thing is gone. The great rabbi is gone. The great teacher is gone. And the Jews have lost their major potential. Joseph, as a politically, politically well connected person, was not our savior. He was, I mean, yeah, he did a great job. And he saved Egypt and he protected us. But Joseph did not have the respect. I mean, you have the resentment of those Egyptians before we know. And they resented this foreign guy for coming and taking over our country or whatever. But Jacob, people revered him. The Goyim revered him. The Egyptians revered him. Even at Goyim. That's where the Jews exposed the future. Because 
the leader who always be there to protect them. I mean, you see a holy man on the street, you know, he's Jewish, and you uh, you say, I'm, I'm gonna hurt those Jews. I'm not gonna hurt those Jews. I think mean, goodness. And then those Jews have, are, 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 are affected by this, this holy rabbi. I heard a Jew, I, I wonder what's gonna happen to me. But now the holy rabbi is gone. Jacob is gone. So the little person gives him to the redeemer. And that's when the Jewish people, their eyes and their hearts began to close. And they go through the unconscious misery. But understand that that happens here. Not next week when slavery began. And it was all before slavery. And it happens when the death of the Messiah, when the holy righteous man passes. That's when the danger begins. And that's when our eyes become closed, our hearts become closed. We begin to and become fearful of suffering. And that's why there is no break, there is no space in the writing of the Torah between last week's Parsha and this week's Parsha. It's closed because we all just want Now, Jacob's passing, of course, is again the celebration of his great life. And yes, uh, he went through great trial and tribulations, and he even shared on Paro and lost years because of it. But there's no taking away greatness. And I think you know it, it's so important to learn that human great people do things wrong, and uh, we're all human. We do most rebellion, and we do a lot of wrong things, and uh, and then some punishes and so forth. And the, the, the rule of Hashem is always uh, the, the equal to all. But I think that. Um, but I think that that doesn't demean that in terms of our estimation. I mean, Jacob was a great man. Jacob was the third of our fathers. Maybe the greatest of all three fathers, for that matter. Greater than Abraham and Isaac. He, saw, he fathered 12 tribes. Not Abraham, not Isaac. What's interesting about um, having the father of the 12 tribes um, is that, uh, of course, he, uh, one of the 12 tribes is great. Joseph, who uh, tested for greatness and according to dreams and came true, and he became the leader of Egypt and they all bowed to him. Um, uh, but, but Jacob spent 17 years, the last 17 years of his time in, uh, in, in Egypt. He came to Egypt 130, he's now 147, he's going to die. Um, now, how old was Joseph when he was abducted from the slave in the beginning? 17. Over 17. You got 17 and 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very close to the four, right? Um, let's take a look at the word Vayachi in Hebrew. Vov, Yud, Chet, Yud. Anyone see it? Can you read the Hebrew? Vov, Yud, Chet, Yud. Um, that's... Um, Vav is six, Yud is ten, Chet is eight, and Yud is ten. How much is that? Thirty-four. Thirty-four. There you go. That was living the Yaakov. The thirty-four best years of his life were the thirty-four years he spent with his son Joseph. The first seventeen, before he was sent away in slavery, and the last seventeen of his life is also with Joseph. Now, tell you something interesting about the number 17. The Hebrew word for tov, for good is tov, pet va bet. Pet is nine, va is six, and bet is two. How much is that? 17. But it's still the 17. It was a big year. Twice 17, 34. Those were the best years of Jacob's life. There's no describing. The extent of relationship between Jacob and Joseph, between Jacob and Joseph, the relationship of father and son, and the special relationship. Yes, he did favor him. Maybe it wasn't the right thing to do, but listen, the relationship was a relationship. It was close. It was loving, and it was learning. That's what they learned it all the time. What does the father do with his son? Especially his prized son, the one that he loves the most, and the one that he sees the greatest promise, and he learns with him. When I went to Yeshiva. Um, when I was 13 in ninth grade, um, went to Yeshiva in Cleveland for a year, uh, abroad, away from home. 
And um, this is she was in a, in one of the world's top yeshivas. And I'm like, I didn't know if they gave it to anybody. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, it was called Tells, T E L Z. And Tells was a, um, was a city in Lithuania. And it became one of the outstanding and most famed of the yeshivas, of all the yeshiva academies in, in Europe. And uh, I had this privilege to go for one year. And in going, um, I, of course, I met some extraordinarily great people, all Holocaust survivors, by the way. But all, I mean, and all my teachers were. Um, so most of my teachers didn't speak English, by the way. <laughs> and if you didn't speak Yiddish, you got nowhere. And, uh, but, but, but they, uh, but it was really great to see, and an awesome experience to see these really great human beings in, in, in the presence. And there was this one great rabbi named Robert Osban, who was uh, the leader of the, of the high school. And uh, he spoke an amazing, uh, he, he, he made an amazing uh, uh, posture. Uh, his appearance, his status, uh, they just you could watch it. You, you felt you were near the present angel. Anyway, he had this son, Prodigy. Is that the word prodigy? Yeah. What's a prodigy? Well, like, you know, like a, 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 a <laughs> coming count. coming count, right. And this boy, uh, was about my age, at 13. In fact, I think I came in my mid His name was Avram. And uh, he would spend the day uh, with his father and, and, and when we all gathered into yeshiva, so we'd all learn, we'd break up into, into, into groups, you know. We call chabuses, and you learn with him, and you learn with her, and you learn, everyone learns with each other, you know. And this father and son team learned up in front. And uh, I don't know, 300 guys in the whole mess, men, and all shul, and we're all watching, we're all learning our own. And then we see the father and son just going at it, and going back and forth and back and forth. And he's teaching them, and he's probably repeating, and he's explaining, and he's questioning, and he's answering. And it's really exciting to watch. And that's, of course, what he's supposed to learn anyway. But this father and son at the chamber was, was really spectacular. I learned that this boy, who was 13, was not in the ninth grade. Well, the 10th, or the 11th, and the 12th. He was already in his college. And he was 13. <laughs> he was a prodigy. And um, uh, he never attended a day of secular life and secular education. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, I guess he must have learned somehow or another in the ABCs or <laughs> whatever. But he, he sat learning all day. That's all he did. And it's learning all day. He now is the, is the world famous leader of the, of the, Tells, uh, uh, the Tells branch in Riverdale, New York. Because I, mean, I, I met him one day, but I remember you when you were a kid, you know. <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, that sense of, of, of connection was a connection of Yaakov and Yosef, Jacob and Joseph. And um, now, of course, it, it, it's uh, the uniting time. It's time of the, of the love between each other to go for the four, two times told, two times good, and then by the key, that's my life and my whole and the over beauty of my existence and so forth. But what's interesting here is that as he's the next passage says, verse 29, it's come time for him to die, he calls Joseph. Well, I thought they were hanging out. I mean, they hung out for sure in the first 17 years, you know that. But were they really hanging together during his last seven years? Well, one could argue that Joseph was very preoccupied with his political responsibility. He's the leader of the tribe. So if that's the case, maybe he really can't spend as much time with his father as he would like. I mean, when I was a kid, it was great, Dad, but you know, now I've got these responsibilities. But there was another reason why. He spent a little time with his, with his father. Because, you know what? Say it. Maybe he was uh, avoiding the questioning of Jacob. And so what happened to you? So he said, I'd rather not be there to put myself in that position to answer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to answer. I'm a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy. You are ready to find He didn't want to hang out with his father because he looked at him and said, what really happened? You know, had, you, had you disappeared, you know? And he didn't want to bring the ropes. How do you avoid saying Russian How do you avoid saying that? Right? Yeah, and you're learning to keep your mouth shut. It's mm -hmm. so important. So, such an important lesson in, in Judaism. And, uh, so, uh, 
Maybe we should all wear masks. We have a good idea. <laughs> and I'm not worried about the COVID so much, but the Russian horror like that. Huh? <laughs> no Russian horror. No, no talking about anybody. No sign of all. That would be a bad idea. Anyway, so Jay, he tells Joseph, if I found favor in your eyes, please place me uh, my hand, your hand under my thigh, right over here. Now, the reason for that is because whenever you make an oath, you have to hold something holy in your hand. In those days, the Jews had no other mitzvah but the mitzvah of circumcision. So by holding his hand over here, he swore by the circumcision. Today, nowadays, in a courtroom, they say, you know, put your hand on the Bible and stuff. The same thing. And he says, swear to me, uh, do kindness and truth with me. And the kindness and truth is the concept. What is the only real true kindness in the world? And lots of things you can do to be kind. Lots of things you can do to be festive. But the truest kindness is the kindness where you never expect someone to do something in return. And that's the concept of burying. It's the dead kid living back to it. So when you do that, that's the ultimate human kindness, uh, going to a funeral. And, um, and uh, he says, please make sure not to bury me in Egypt, which means I want you to take care of my burial, but not here. The implication, of course, that you got to take care of it. Uh, the other brothers may not have the power you have. You have the power. You're, you're the Egyptian by, by Freud. And uh, I want you to, uh, to, to, to do this for me, but not in Egypt. Why does Inyaka want to be buried in Egypt? Well, every Jew wants to be buried in the Holy Land, shall we say. Besides, uh, besides my grandfather Abraham and his wife and the grandmother Sarah are my Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And so is uh, my father and mother, Yitzhak and Rivka. And so is my wife Leah. So I should be there too. Um, but I think also there's a concern that Jacob did not want the Egyptians to worship him. And he didn't want uh, his graves in the shrine. And so therefore he wanted out of Egypt. It wasn't so much Israel he wanted, he wanted out of Egypt just as much, not more so. In any event, that's what he tells Joseph. And he says, let's, uh, you take care of it and do this period of time this for me. Um, uh, he says, uh, he says uh, I personally uh, will do as you said. And he said, swear to it. And he swears to it. Um, the, the idea, of course, is that, um, is that uh, Joseph will, will swear to it. Uh, but a, it's a strange reason. It's a strange demand. I mean, like, wouldn't, wouldn't your father expect that of a son? Wouldn't the fall expect of a son to do that? Why do they swear? Because there would be pressure. Yeah. There might be pressure on him, you're right, but he's but, but, but here I think you might say, right, right, right. Yeah, they honor them. But but nevertheless, but nevertheless, I mean, a son's a son. You're, you're supposed to do it, there's no still be a father, no? Yeah. But what's the, what's this, this great the procedure here? Is the answer yeah. is that I'm yeah. right. is that Yago. Did not want Joseph to do this to him because he was involved. Jacob, Yaakov wanted it to be done because it's the mitzvah. I want you to do this not because you love me, because you love God. I want you to do this because it's the right thing to do. I want you to do this not, yeah, it's emotion, it's emotion, it's that, that. But you know, um, to be a truly great person to do the right thing as I trained you to do to be a God-fearing person the emotions shouldn't cloud it because if the emotions do cloud then you'll be kind to this one in your life but you won't be very kind to that one and you don't want and that's not exactly what God wants you can be kind to everybody you can be the same yeah you're a doctor your enemy comes in front of you and, 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 and yeah, you got treated. Well, what do you do, Doc? <laughs> you got treated, right? That's a challenge to your parents. Yeah, challenge, right? Right. Right. And, and I think that, um, I think that, that uh, that's what the Yako wants. You really want to honor me. There's no greater honor you can give me than following my footsteps and following my teachings and following the traditions and not veering off to some sideways. Stay with what I've placed. That's key word. Right? That's honoring. We talked about the story about the two guys that were uh, religious people. One was a religious Jew, and the other was a religious voodoo worshiper. 
<laughs> and they were in the hospital room. And I told you the story. And they're in the hospital room. And, and, and um, uh, two, two beds in a room. And he's over there and he's over there. They both have sons visiting them on their deathbeds. And, uh, and uh, both sons are rebellious. He's no longer a religious Jew. He's the son. He, he left his father. And he certainly didn't listen to his father's footsteps and worship the, the Buddha. So therefore, the, 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 the both fathers are crying to their sons, saying, the son, please, you know, when I pass away, please, please, please at least do, do me the one the thing. It says the Jewish father, uh, please say Kaddish for me. I said, the voodoo guy, please worship the voodoo for me. Right? And both guys die. What happens? Do both do it? No. Do neither do it? Or the one and the other do it? That's the Kaddish. The more likely is that the guy who's Jewish, even rebellious, will say the Kaddish. The likelihood of the voodoo guy worshiping the voodoo guy. I mean, that's hysterical. I said, Dad, I love you with all my heart, but that's nuts. I mean, I mean that's ridiculous. I can't do that. So we got a perspective here of trying to understand that, again, the whole sense of, 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 of honoring parents, particularly after their passing, is because of the tradition that's been planted inside. And that tradition uh, reflects upon them. Uh, the viewing work from that tradition uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is uh, causing anguish to the parents. And that's why Yaakov really wants from, from Joseph. In any event, um, uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, Marsha continues and Yaakov uh, wants to bless his grandsons uh, Ephraim and Menashe. Those are the two sons of, of, of uh, Joseph and he blesses them and um, and, he, and finally, um, uh, he, he, he blesses Joseph himself on page 273, verse 15. Um, and, he, and he says in verse 16, the angel that had redeemed me, had redeemed me from all my evil, you know, for all those challenges that Joseph had, he always, Jacob had, he always had that special angel with him, right? For, for 273, verse 16. The angel redeemed from all evil bless will bless these lads, uh, bless Ephraim and Menashe, and along with the names of my father's Avram and Yitzchak, and they will be like fish in the land and, and, and procreate and become great. The Hebrew is Amalak Hagoyanosim. Amalak Hagoyanosim the shame of my son, the shame of my son, Abraham, the Yisra, the Yitguru, the Yitguru, the Kere, This is a child's love. This is what mommies sing to their children from their clothes. Put the babies to bed. Three years old, two and a half, three, four, five, all through their childhood. Let's say the Shema before we go to bed, because you all do that, right? And then we sing it to the song. And the children learn the angel who protected our Diablo will protect me, and the angel will protect me. And he protected my sisters, I don't know if it's not And this is the, 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 the lullaby that all babies, all children go to bed with. Nearly every night. Um, it's of course a concept that uh, children are blessed by their parents. But we talked about blessings before. We talked about Yitzchak blessing, the wine to bless Yitzchak, and then the blessing Yaakov. What's the idea of the blessing? The idea of the blessing is to say, as parents, we have the power to bless our children because we care about our children. It simply means that what? Well, anytime you really care, you have that power. You can bring a blessing to someone if you really care about them. Parents certainly care for their children and bring this, this beautiful blessing. And so um, the, um, the the parish continues on the page, <coughs> chapter 49, uh, verse 275, uh, page 275, chapter 49, and Jacob now calls for his sons and assemble yourself, and I'll tell you what will be for you at the end of days. Gather yourself and listen, sons of Jacob, 
and listen to this with your father, and he's going to go one by one and bless each and every one. Uh, but before he blesses them, he tells them, uh, assemble yourself, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the end of days. Now, um, that means, according to the Gemara, that he wanted to tell them when Mashiach's coming. Now, it could be the Mashiach of today, it could be the Mashiach of then. Who was the Mashiach of then? Moshe himself. Moshe was the one that took the people out of Egypt. And so he wanted to tell them, yes, harsh days are coming, but I will tell you the Mashiach, the Moshe's coming. The Mashiach's coming, the Mashiach's coming, and get you out of here. And um, he uh, says, gather around and listen to Israel, your father. And then he goes into the bracha and does not tell them. And the question is obvious. And you see, if you're learning really well, scholarly, then you would look at this passage and you would read it. You'd go, I'll tell you what's going to happen at the end of the days. Gather yourself, listen to me. And then you say, Where is it? Where is it? That's using your scholarship. You understand? That's how they learn. Take things seriously here. Take things literally. If he says you're going to tell him, then tell me. Now, maybe it's for this Mashiach that's coming to redeem us now. I sure would like that way it's coming. Everybody would. But then again, Yaakov didn't reveal that either. So why didn't he reveal it? Says the Talmud, says the Gemara, Yaakov really wanted to tell them. But Hashem took the knowledge away from you. You know, have a moment when you think of something and you want to say it, so the tip of your tongue and you said it. You have it all the time, no? Someone said, not letting you say it. And you really want to say it. I, I, I hold on, I'm just thinking about it. I, I got it, I got it. Hold on. Because Hashem, maybe doesn't want you to reveal it. Or maybe Hashem wants to take it away from you, even. You have this plan. A thought or idea, and now you forgot what you're thinking about. So, Yaakov is not allowed to reveal this. The question is why? Why can't Yaakov, why can't we know when Mashiach is coming? Well, for a starter, if let's say I knew that Mashiach was coming in 50 years. You are be I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. Right? So, 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 my grandfather, I brought my two children, one of whom is a and uh, one of whom is a smart father of the Arab nation. Then my father, Yitzchak, had two sons, one of whom was a terrible person, my brother, my two brothers, and me. I have 12. If maybe one of each of my fathers had one son that was no good, maybe I have one that's no good. And maybe, therefore, um, I mean, that's the reason I should have let me have that information. Because, because we will not release information in the presence of a Russia of an evil person. Maybe one of my 12 was no good. And um, the brothers and the son all sense this. And they're watching. And they see his face in anguish. And they realize what he's thinking. They realize. And they say that the following words. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel. Who's Israel? Jacob, our father. Listen, Father. Listen clearly, Father. Hashem is our God. Hashem is what? We all believe. There's unity amongst us. We can rest easy. We're not fighting anymore. And we all believe, we're all on the same page. So, of course, Yaakov, for his part, is relieved. He's happy. And he realizes that it's improper and appropriate to release the information of the end of days because 
um, because it's it's just not the it's just not the right thing to do. People have to have faith and trust in Hashem when it comes to the uh, to the concept of uh, of waiting for Mashiach, and so therefore he can't know that. Good time to learn. What would we do if we can be on chandeliers and our furniture uh, just pack up in the suitcase and just go. We do it. Uh, yeah. We do it. We do it. But I can read everything back. Right? Just put whatever you can in the suitcase. Uh, there you go. Right? Amazing, huh? So, um, it's not right for us to know. So if it's not right for us to know, why did I should not let uh, at least uh, Yaakov had the comfort of knowing that his sons are all right. So he responds to his sons. They said to Shema. They said, Hero Israel, right? We believe in God. And he responded and said, Roof, shame, clothes, father, clothes, and the Now, if you're familiar, you say the Shema every day, you know that Roof, shame is there. Okay. Understand. The Ruch Shem Tavot, the, the Shema is in the Torah. It's in the fifth book of the Torah. The whole Shema of your heart of Hashem, like that, all of you know, right? There's no Ruch Shem Tavot there. Not there. Mm-hmm. Ruch Shem Tavot is not part of the Shema. You say the Shema, you say the first portion, love of God, you say the second portion, with the Mitzvah, you say the third portion, Tzitzit. There's no Ruch Shem Tavot. No. There's no, what is Ruch Shem Tavot? Less of the name and the glory of God's kingdom forever. Right. It does not appear in the Torah, it's not part of the Shema. But we say, why do we say it? In memory of and in honor of the Yaakov. See, Yaakov said, Shem to the Shema that his son said, we'll respond and we'll do the same thing. Shema Yisrael, Baruch Shem Tavod. There's only one little problem with that. Baruch Shem Tavod is an existing prayer or phrase, but it's not on earth. It's going for the angels. And it's not right for us. To use the prayer that belongs to them. So therefore, our Baruch Shem Tavod has to be recited softly. Yes. Isn't that why when people when you don't say it because you don't say the prayer? You do say it. How about it? About so in other words, words Baruch Shem Tavod is whispered throughout the year. My Israel and Shema Shem said out loud. Oh, here, 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 you know, he was saying the Shema in his prayers. One should not. Say them softly. Why don't you say it out loud? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokein, Hashem Elokein. The Baruch Shem Tavod, soft. The most of the angels. In memory of Jacob, his response to his son will say Baruch Shem Now, God is before. And we are like angels, right? We are all not eating, not drinking, not having relations with wives, husbands, not putting on shoes, uh, uh, not uh, 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 washing, not uh, anointing with oils. We have these five afflictions, which means we're like angels. We're not, we're not doing it on that one day. On that one day, when you're not indulging in your physicality, you are spiritual. The amazing thing on a young people day to just feel yourself and sense that all of you is nothing but a soul. Like the fingers in the hand, and you know, where it was the body, it means nothing. It's just, it, yeah, I'm a soul, that's what I am, on that one day, and it's, a, it's an incredible experience. I mean, not to be in sure and meant to go up, you know, let me see now, on, 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 the, <laughs> on the essence of life, uh, on, on the apex of life. So, that day I'm an angel, I scream out, Earl Shemkevo, blessed are the glory of God's kingdom, forever and ever and ever, go ahead. Now, this reminiscent of Yaakov's experience upon blessing his children means to suggest that one of the best times to bless your children is not only every Friday night, but also on the Passover. And that's really the, the last time you get, the last chance you get. What do you do with the last few minutes of your life? To bless your children. Because they're the continuum of you in this world. Right? Man passes away, a woman passes away, and then what happens? <coughs> and this man and woman fathered and mothered a child. 
this child, so I'm going to look like their mother, look like their fathers. This child continues to walk in this world and live in this world. That means that the father or mother are still alive. All right? A, a little part of them is still left around, so to speak, right? And that is the continuum of, uh, of, of, of the bracha that is left to the children by the parent upon the parent's blessing. And so the parsha ends uh, with uh, uh, the, the blessings are done. You can, uh, um, I don't want to go through them all. And the blessings, you should look at them uh, so far. So, uh, some part on Shabbat and try to see what each, what each, uh, uh, each uh, uh, tribe represents. And, um, and uh, we now know that uh, we go to 287, 287, and, and, and uh, verse 15 at the bottom of the page. Joseph's brothers realized that their father was dead. They came to, and they came, they said amongst themselves, Joseph will for sure have a hatred and vengeance against us now and repay us for all the evil that we did to him because Paul is not around to protect us. So they told Joseph, your father gave orders before his death that you should say to Joseph, kindly forgive them. Page 289. And um, we know for a fact that it is not written anywhere that Jacob ever said it. So they lied. For good cause. But they didn't really lie. They just changed the truth. And that, Rabbi Steve, is permissible for the purpose of peace. It's okay <coughs> from time to time to you don't have to say everything. The PMI again, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to say everything. You know, you, know, you can alter the truth a little bit to keep the peace. So it says in Kabbalah. And therefore, the brothers were right in what they did. Of course, Joseph, from his part, had no intention anymore at all. They have been reconciled plenty over the last 17 years, and um, there was no intent on his part to take vengeance whatsoever. In any event, uh, in verse 19, uh, 18, I'm sorry, uh, they say, we're going to be your slaves. And 19, Joseph said, if you're not, am I instead of God? You didn't send me here. Shem sent me here. Yeah, you did a wrong thing. You paid for it. But at the end, that's what Shem wanted. So when somebody does wrong to you, maybe they tap it wrong, and they got to deal with it. But you don't have to. What are you taking? I should have said it's coming to anyway. Otherwise, it wouldn't have come. So the fact that someone did something wrong to you is kind of sad. Uh, that, that you feel bad for the guy. I mean, you just told me, oh, you just embarrassed me, you just cursed me, you just stared at me, you just said everything bad to me, right? I'm sorry for you. How many people are going to say that? I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you dirty. Sorry for you. There's no problem. You gotta work it out. I I suffered because of it. Shem did. And Shem wanted me to go to Mitzrayim so that I could interpret Pyro's dreams and save the food and save the country. And it happened. People think in those terms, they become less vengeful, they become more able to deal with situations. And um, certainly uh, avoids a lot of uh, arguments and fighting, stuff like that. Um, but it makes you also just be at peace with yourself. And that's really the whole idea. How do we get to be at peace with ourselves? Listen to me. What's the mission? Listen to me. And therefore, somehow or another, I can maintain peace, not only with my antagonists and people are against me, I just maintain peace within myself. Myself and children. And so Joseph uh, uh, lives in Egypt. Uh, Joseph um, says to his brethren in page 20, verse 24, I'm about to die. God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land and explore to Abraham and Jacob. You're not staying here. Don't worry. Yeah, it'll be tough for a couple of years. Just want to tell you. 
<laughs> but but at the end of the day, Hashem guaranteed. So when Moshe Rabbeinu comes years later and says to the Jews, well, I'm taking you out of Mitzrayim, so Hashem has sent me. For the Jews, they said, oh yeah, we've been waiting for this for 210 years. We didn't give up. We're now in the age of 2,000 years. We haven't given up. It's just a come. It's just a come. So, so therefore, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the promises made by Joseph his brothers, and Joseph said them in, in 25, when God will indeed remember you and bring you up, bring my bones out of here as well. They're going to bury me in here, but I want to go back to Israel as well. But I can't go back now because there's no one around who's politically correct or politically capable to take me the way I was taking my father. So therefore, when, when we all go out of here, when we all go out of here, let's take make my bones with you. Anyone remember and know who was the one person that managed or that uh, actually undertook the task to collect the uh, remains of Joseph in the coffin and bring him uh, to the home church itself? I'm sure they I'm sure they That's right. Moshe himself. Now, Moshe himself, greatest man of all time, cares for Joseph. Who's going to care for Moshe when he dies? God himself. God himself. Mm -hmm. So um, he lives to 110, they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Um, when Moshe took them out, took, 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 took the Jews out of Egypt, so they carried, I imagine, the, the, the little coffin of Joseph as they were marching out. And then they came to the sea, the Yamsu. And at the Yamsu, they said, going to make this great miracle, and she went to the sea. Right? And then it passes, this is a very compassionate film. The, the sea saw something and, 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 and split because of it. The bottom, the remains. The sea saw the sea saw. The sea saw, the sea saw the bones of Joseph and split. Why was it the, why was it special about? Joseph's coffin and made the sea split and let the Jews go to, 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 to dry land. The answer is because you see, Hashem wants to see you know, the wants to the see it. C E A. S E A. There's, there's S E A and S E A. Well, let me get it straight. And the, Hashem wants the S E A C to uh, to, uh, uh, to to split so the Jews can go and dry land and be free, correct? Right? And, and then down the Egyptian, right? So he's asking the, 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 the sea to do something unnatural, uh, uh, very miraculous, very, very uh, uh, but, uh, but beyond the, its normal nature. The normal nature of the sea is the flow. You want me to split? What she wants? Hashem says, look at Joseph. Joseph did something unusual. Joseph was tempted by a boat to drive away. Temptation was over. He was tempted. She came after him day after day after day. She pulls his jacket off. She wants him. How easy. What a pleasure. And all of a sudden, Moses says, Shannon, what do you do? Somehow or another, as a natural thing would have been to do the error to make the mistake. And he didn't. He was unnatural. He was. Above the norm, he resisted. He saw his father. He saw his father. The sea saw him. If the sea sees Joseph able to break his nature, then the sea will break its nature, and the sea will split, and the Jews will march into into safety. So the two hundred and ten years the Jews were in Egypt in slavery. Understand that uh, that that um, all this time. We understood the need to preserve Joseph's coffin in order to realize that we can't get out of Egypt without him. He brought us there. He's going to take us out. Posthumous. He's going to take us out. Because it's only because of him that the sea split. Hayomra of Alanos. The sea saw and split. So 
in, in the sense of who Joseph was and the merit that he brings to our people, obviously the last few hours of my time, certainly posthumously and so forth. Now, uh, the book is over. So, what do we say to celebrate? Okay. 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 Let's take a look. On the bottom of 7, 289, everyone say with me. Chazak, Chazak, Venet Chazay. Be strong, be strong. May we be strengthened to continue learning next Thursday, the new book of the Torah. Everyone have a great Shabbat, and uh, we all look forward to meeting again next week for uh, the beginning and embarking upon new learning. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Rabbi.